Ave Maria Purissima. Uh, as always, feel free to record my sermons. Uh, my general superior has instructed me that I may not publish my sermons or have anyone publish them on for me. So I'll get uh, merit for that. I'll get merit for that. Uh, please pray for the superiors because they've taken responsibility for anyone that could be helped and won't be helped. So keep them in your prayers. Today is the great feast of Christ the King. It was established in 1925 by Pope Pius XI, who in describing the true Christian ideal said that, quote, if to Christ our Lord is given all power in heaven and on earth, if all men purchased by his precious blood are by a new right subjected to his dominion, if this power embraces all men, then it must be clear that not one of our faculties is exempt from his empire. He must reign in our minds, which should assent with perfect submission and firm belief to revealed truths and to the doctrines of Christ. He must reign in our wills, which should obey the laws and the precepts of God. He must reign in our hearts, which should spurn natural desires and love God above all things and cleave to him alone. He must reign in our bodies, which should serve as instruments for the interior sanctification of our souls. And that once men recognize, both in private and in public life, that Christ is king, society will at last receive the great blessings of real liberty, well-ordered discipline, peace, and harmony. Close quotes the Vicar of Christ. Christ is king, and he must reign in our minds, in our wills, in our hearts, in our bodies. Once men recognize, both in private and public life, that Christ is king, society will at last receive the great blessings of real liberty, well-ordered discipline, peace, and harmony. Pius XI makes it clear that the chief difficulties facing mankind consist in turning away from Christ in public and private life. Here are just a few of the specific objections made by Pius XI to the situation of his day. And this is 40 years before the Council. And notice how current these problems seem, even though this was written 92 years ago. Quote, We cannot but lament the general spirit of insubordination and the refusal to live up to one's obligations, which has become so widespread as almost to appear the customary mode of living. We lament, too, the destruction of purity among women and young girls, as is evidenced by the increasing modesty of their dress and the conversation, and by their, their participation in shameful dances. Legislation was passed which did not recognize that either God or Jesus Christ had any rights over marriage, an erroneous view which debased matrimony to the level of a mere civil contract. God and Jesus Christ, as well as his doctrines, were banished from the school. As an inevitable consequence, the school became not only secular, non-religious, but openly atheistical and anti-religious. In such circumstances, it was easy to persuade poor, ignorant children that neither God nor religion are of any importance as far as their daily lives are concerned. God's name, moreover, was scarcely ever mentioned in such schools unless it were to blaspheme or to ridicule his church. The sense of man's personal dignity and of the value of human life has been lost. And for those who think that Catholic name and name only politicians, professors, and authors are recent development, listen to this. I quote again from the Pope. Many believe in, or claim they believe in, hold fast to Catholic doctrine. But in spite of these protestations, they speak, write, and what is more, act, as if it were not necessary any longer to follow the teachings and solemn pronouncements of the Holy See. Those are all quotes from Pius XI. We could go on and on simply citing papal warnings from Pius XI that were, for the most part, ignored. Now hold those thoughts uh, for a while, and let's turn to the current crisis in the Church, try to come to a deeper understanding, a spiritually fruitful understanding of what is going on right now and why. With that in mind, I'll read and comment upon excerpts from a very insightful work. I have to apologize as the author has fairly tightly constructed arguments as he doesn't want his work to be edited, so out of deference to him, I won't uh, name him since I've massively uh, 
rearranged, edited, and cut and pasted his work. So I took a 160-page book and put it into a sermon. Yeah, I want to make it clear anything good here can't be credited to me, although the errors are certainly mine. Okay, so we'll start with a thumbnail sketch of what may be called the standard traditionalist explanation for the current crisis. And as we see, whether or not someone subscribes to this particular explanation doesn't really matter, because our response should still be the same. Okay, so the standard explanation offered by many traditional Catholics to explain the present crisis is that a group of liberal theologians and bishops uh, gained control at the Second Vatican Council. They wrote the documents in such a way they contained ambiguous phrases, verbal time bombs, which then could be exploited after the Council to implement all these disastrous changes. So since the Council, they've gained access to virtually all the key positions, including the papacy, in order to implement these changes. And since God respects man's free will and the choices men make, we're now in a position of being ruled by a bunch of modernists who are in control of the Vatican bureaucracy, and to a large extent, the papes and episcopacy. Okay, now for most of us, if we've heard that once, we've heard it a thousand times, or 10,000 times, or a million times. The liberals hijacked everything, or nearly everything at the council, and now they've got the levers of power. Okay, so for the most part, that seems to be true. We'll grant that anyway for the sake of the argument. So what we might call the standard explanation for the crisis is liberals hijacked everything or nearly everything, and now they're in control. And again, for the sake of the argument, not only going to grant that it's being true, you can even embellish on that and paint it as dark and dismal as, as, as you like. Because if indeed it is all true, and we're not questioning that, I'm not even going to touch on that, it's not the point here. Even if it's even all true, we have to be very, very careful not to simply draw the natural conclusions from that. Well, what do you mean, Father? I'm saying that even granting that liberals have hijacked everything and now are holding levels of power and granting the worst possible uh, scenarios, we have to be very, very careful not to simply draw the natural conclusions from that. Now, why in the world would we want to be very careful not to try, simply draw the natural conclusions from that? The reason is because we're dealing with the Catholic Church. And so we also have to be very careful to draw the supernatural conclusions from all that. Now, what are we saying? We're saying that even grand liberals have hijacked everything and now hold new levels of power in the church. We have to be careful not to simply draw the natural conclusions from that. But because we're dealing with the Catholic Church, the one true church established by Christ Himself, we must also be careful to draw the supernatural conclusions. Let's consider the dangers of a strictly natural way of thinking here. If we aren't careful and we only think naturally, we could easily be tempted towards a series of desperate and despairing thoughts when we consider the utter chaos, the sin and the confusion within the church. And then we end up scandalizing ourselves. And that's actually a very common problem. I spend a lot of my priesthood basically talking people off ledges, and the problem has grown massively in the last few years. For example, many otherwise good people who love the church who have allowed themselves to be scandalized have gotten to the point where they somehow believe that a few puny men have seized control of the church and have the power to do whatever they please. But thinking simply on the natural level leaves on the central consideration. Is it reasonable to believe that a few puny men have somehow wrested the control of the church out of the hands of the Almighty God? Is it reasonable to believe that through all this, God hasn't been paying attention? Is it reasonable to believe that when Christ said, I will be with you always, what he really meant was only until the Second Vatican Council? Is that what we're supposed to believe? Because either God's in charge, or he isn't. We need to be very careful to think supernaturally. We need to be very, very careful to think like Catholics, and keep in mind exactly whose church this is. We're compelled by the scriptures to believe in God's extraordinary love for his church, 
an inspired, inerrant word of God we read in Ephesians chapter 5, and I quote, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and delivered himself up for it, that he might sanctify it, cleansing by laver of water and the word of life, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Close quote. The inspired, inerrant word of God. Now that does not mean that God is strictly obliged to everything he could conceivably do in order to bring every man to heaven. But such a love surely does mean that his relationship to his mystical body, the church, is of such a nature as to not allow a situation in which he has virtually abandoned his flock to the wolves. This is really important. God's relationship to his mystical body, the church, is of such a nature as to not allow a situation in which he has virtually abandoned his flock to the wolves. But isn't that precisely what many traditionalists seem to believe? God's relationship to his mystical body, the church, is of such a nature to not allow a situation in which he has virtually abandoned his flock to the wolves. If Christ's love, as described by St. Paul, be true, and it is, and if the following three points, which are all taught by Vatican I, be true, and they are. First, that Christ established in Peter and his successors all that is necessary to secure the perpetual welfare and lasting good of the Church. And second, if Peter through Christ lives, presides, and judges this day always in his successors. And third, if Christ has not abandoned the direction of the Church, and the standard explanation for the crisis that the liberals have hijacked everything are now holding levels of power in the church. The standard explanation is actually an extraordinarily shallow view of what is what happening within Christ's beloved, the church. God certainly does respect our free will, but we can't bind his hands. He's God. He can easily ensure that the church will have shepherds according to his will. And if you think about that for a minute or two, it's pretty scary. He can easily ensure that the church has shepherds according to his will. As St. Gregory the Great said, quote, divine justice provides shepherds according to the just deserts of the faithful. Close quote. That's frightening. Divine justice provides shepherds according to the just deserts of the faithful. Now besides all that, we should also be aware of something called efficient grace. Now efficient grace doesn't tamper at all with our freedom, but what it does do is exert such a powerful effect upon the heart and mind of a man as to make it virtually certain that he'll comply with God's will. And that would certainly include the leaders in the church. So what's your point, Padre? Here's the point. God loves his mystical body, the church, and he died for it on the cross. We know from both scripture and tradition that his relationship to the mystical body of the church is of such a nature as to not allow a situation in which he has virtually abandoned his flock to the wolves. And we know that because God is all-powerful, he can easily ensure that the church will have shepherds according to his will. And we know that God will provide the shepherds that his people deserve. And so we know that if it be true that a bunch of liberals are in power, it can't be without God's approval in some way. We're going to consider that in some detail. So if it be true that a bunch of liberals are in power, it can't be without God's approval in some way. So it might be fruitful for us to consider what exactly we have done to deserve such a scourging. Here's the point. It is an absolutely necessary conclusion the present crisis in the church is not just due to the permissive will of God, but to his positive will. We're going to unpack that. It is an absolutely necessary conclusion that the present crisis in the church is not just due to the permissive will of God. And it's not just because God is permitting the crisis, but the crisis is also due to his positive will. In other words, God is also willing the crisis. The present crisis is not just because God is permitting the crisis, God is also willing the crisis. 
This is essential to understand. Let's pause for a minute and we'll walk back through that to make sure that everyone here gets this. If you want to really understand what's going on, if you really want to understand that, you need to burn this into your mind. If Christ's love for his church, as described by St. Paul, be true, and it is, and if the following three points, all taught by Vatican I, be true, and they are, first, that Christ established in Peter and his successors all that is necessary to secure the perpetual welfare and lasting good of the church, and he did. And second, if Peter lives, presides, and judges this day always in his successors, popes, and he does. And third, if Christ has not abandoned the direction of the church, and he hasn't, then it is an absolutely necessary conclusion that the present crisis in the church is not due just to the permissive will of God. It's not just because God is permitting the crisis, but also to his positive will. He's actually willing the crisis. And of course, this means that the standard traditional explanation is completely inadequate, spiritually seeking. The standard traditional explanation actually misses the whole point. The present crisis in the church is not just due to the permissive will of God. It's not just because he's permitting this to happen. It's also due to his positive will. God is positively willing this crisis. What are we saying? We're saying he's not just permitting, he's willing it. This should come to no surprise to anyone who reads their Bible. In other words, just as there was something in the positive will of God involved in sending the Babylonians and the Assyrians in, in, against the Jews as a means of chastisement and eventual renewal, so also we must conclude that the changes wrought by Vatican II and the post-considered papacies and these synods and all this other crazy stuff going on are due in some way to the positive will of God. We may be faced with confusion when we try to relate the present chaos in the church to the promises which Christ made to his church and also the promises and guarantees laid out for us in the doctrinal teaching of Vatican Council I. But such confusion is really the lack, a result of our lack of understanding between the, of the relationship between good, evil, and punishment. Now everyone here can go read chapter 6 of the book of Leviticus, 26 of the book of Leviticus chapter 26, and in one chapter you can see that these principles covered in detail in sacred scripture. That's Leviticus 26. It'll take you five minutes to read it. But today we're going to turn to that greatest of all doctors of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas asks the question whether God is the cause of evil. Without going through the entire answer, it's not necessary, he points out, well, God is not the cause of moral evils, sin that since justice is part and parcel of the divine order in the universe, then it is necessary that the penalties for the violation of justice be imposed on sinners. Justice requires that penalties should be dealt out to sinners. And so God does cause the evils which are imposed on sinners as the penalties for the violation of justice. Again, God does cause the evils which are penalties for sinners, but he's not caused sin itself. He only permits that. Thus, St. Thomas. Okay, let's start drawing this together. First point. The chaos and evil in the church today is a mixture of God's penalty for sin and man's fault. A mixture which is very difficult to sort out in most situations. Second point. God does not cause any moral evil to suggest that would be blasphemy. God truly does not desire the death or ruin of any man. Third point. According to the teaching of Vatican I, God in some way positively wills the orientations and policies of the popes, and that includes the popes before, during, and since Vatican II. Fourth point, if these policies seem in any way evil to us, then we need to consider the probability this orientation is a chastisement designed to draw us out of deep sin, sin which only would have gone deeper if God had continued to bless us with what we had loved, had and loved before this chastisement. That bears repeating. The chaos and evil in the church today is a mixture of God's penalty and man's sin. That is a mixture that's very difficult to sort out by us in most situations. God is not the author of any moral evil. He truly does not desire the death or the ruin of any man. According to the teaching of Vatican I, God in some way positively wills the orientations and policies of the pontificates, and that would include since Vatican II, 
And if these policies seem in any way evil to us, we need to consider the very real probability that this orientation is a chastisement designed to draw us out of deep sin, sin which would have only gone deeper if God had continued to bless us with what we had and loved before the chastisement. What are we saying? We're saying that the crisis in the church, and it's a real crisis, is a penalty. It's a chastisement which is not simply being permitted, but positively being willed by God. It's a chastisement designed to draw us out of deep sin. So what deep sin could we possibly be talking about? A simple reading of papal encyclicals ranging from the middle of the 19th century right up to Vatican II makes it clear that the pre-Vatican II Catholic world was, while outwardly appearing healthy, profoundly diseased within. We started this term with concrete examples taken from the encyclical on Christ the King in 1925. And it sounds like it could be written, those warnings could be written today. Why? Because nothing was done. Right here in America, for example, we supposedly possess the best Catholic school system in the world. Our convents were full of vocations, the priests were abundant. We believed, for the most part, what was written in the Baltimore Catechism. At the same time, though, we believed in unlimited economic, scientific, and technological progress. We were up to our necks in usury, to the crime against nature, and the pursuit of unlimited financial gain. Every diocese has investments that are usurious. There's infallible teaching against this. Infallible. Dante puts sodomites and users in the same level of hell because the sodomites take something that's fruitful and make it sterile, and the users take something sterile and make it fruitful. I'm not going to get into it, but I just want to point that out. We're up to our necks and stuff that's against the teaching of the church, the solemn teaching of the church and the natural law. We began to tolerate the teaching of evolution to our children, came to believe it in ever-growing numbers. Leo XIII was already fighting that in the late 1800s. The priests and religious began to disbelieve the teachings of the fathers, and then to tolerate, and then believe the blasphemous claims of so-called modern scripture scholarship. Leo XIII was already fighting that in the late 1800s. We increasingly believe that the psychological analysis and materialistic explanations of human behavior are deeper and more important than understanding the different effects upon human uh, behavior of sin and virtue and the working of God's grace. Many Catholics welcome divorce. Leo XIII was already fighting that late 1800s, and many Catholics long for contraception. Pius XI was fighting that. Many Catholics uh, polluted Sundays and Holy Days with their worldly activities, and more and more, God became a one-hour Sunday appendage to the real pursuit of our lives. God became a one-hour Sunday intermission in the midst of the real pursuit of our lives. You can go out on the street and you can't tell a Catholic from anybody else. That's scary. We carelessly allowed the mass media to introduce ever more banality, worldliness, and modesty, and crudity into our society and even into our homes. We made sports our religion. In large part, we ignored the teaching and prudential warnings of the popes on questions of philosophy, dogma, morals in the political and social realms. In short, Christ was only allowed to rule certain areas of our lives. If God let us come here to these United States, so many of the Catholics that are here, our ancestors immigrated to get away from the chaos and revolutions and so forth. If he came to let us come here, why? It was to help the United States become Catholic. Instead, the Catholics became Americans. Instead of America becoming Catholic. And we have the cure for hell. And no one else does. And what have we done with it? What have we done with it? Christ was only really allowed to rule certain aspects of our life. Christ was not the king across the board, both public and private lives. In other words, we were attempting to serve both God and the world in a, complete, in a way completely unprecedented 
in human history. The most fundamental teaching of the gospel concerning our primary obligation towards loving and following Christ was being drowned beneath this duplicity. Christ the Lord has specifically told us that, quote, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. For where thy treasure is, there is thy heart also. Close quotes, that's God the Son. You can't serve God and man, for where thy treasure is, their heart is also. We as a Catholic people, we're trying to serve two masters. But God only puts up with this kind of behavior for a while. As St. Alphonsus explains, quote, when at length God sees they are willing to yield neither to benefits, nor threats, nor admonitions, and that we will not amend, then he is forced by our own selves to punish us. When he does chastise, it is not to please himself, but because we have driven him to it. Close quotes. That's St. Alphonsus, doctor of the church. When at length God sees that we will not yield to benefits, nor threats, nor admonitions, and we will not amend, then he is forced by our own selves to punish us. When he does chastise, it's not to please himself, but because we draw him to it. What is the most effective chastisement that God can inflict on a man in such a situation? It's to let him have what he wants. God simply hands the man over to his own natural freedom. It's as if he said, okay, you don't want to do it my way? Do it your way. That's perhaps the most obvious feature of this chastisement. Take, for example, the new Mass. It facilitates this approach. Sure, it can be said reverently, and in some places it certainly is, but for the most part, if a non-Catholic were to attend an average parish Mass, and just carefully observe what transpires before, during, and after Mass, in the sanctuary and the pews, you'd be very hard-pressed to commit, convince him that the priest or the faithful truly believed the quietest was really present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, the most blessed sacrament the altar, very hard to press. I took a really good friend of mine when I was in grad school, really serious fundamentalist, got a doctorate in physical chemistry, really smart guy, really knew his Bible. He wanted to go to Mass. I took him to the best thing he could find in our country. When he came out, he said, all right, Phil, I'm not talking about you, but I don't believe for a second those people in there believe what you say they believe. Because if they did, they wouldn't be acting like that. What could I say? It's true. Turning man over to his own natural freedoms is what a whole host of other new things in the church is about. The relaxation of the fasting laws, the permission for girl halter boys, indiscriminate promotion of NFP, annulments for virtually any reason. Uh, perhaps the worst for the chastisements is the ecumenical movement by which the church and all the faithful are in effect lowered into the pool of the world's errors and sins. All these things have the effect of promoting natural freedom. You don't want to do it my way? Do it your way. It's all spiritual democracy. And if we as a Catholic people had come to the point of living profoundly duplicitous lives, if we'd surrendered ourselves to the world and all the other aspects of our lives, political, economic, educational, recreational, etc. Then why should we find it surprising that God should hand us over to our own desires in our spiritual lives? Why should we find it surprising that he'd hand us over to our own desires in our spiritual lives? So that being reduced to helplessness, we might eventually turn away from our duplicity and return to our poverty and in humility. It's clear that the idea that the Pope, the Council of Synods, the liberal bishops, theologians, priests are solely responsible for Christ in the Church is unbelievably superficial, and we're not saying they're not, not part of it. But we're not excusing it, but we're saying the view that they're solely responsible is unbelievably superficial, and yet this is the dominant view among people that call themselves traditional Catholics. And we're just, yet, yeah, it's this very focus on blaming the Pope, on blaming the Council, the bishops, the cardinals, Etc. Et it's this very focus that prevents us from per, that prevents us from perceiving the real roots of infidelity in our own behavior, in our own attempts to serve both God and Mammon. 
and our own refusal to acknowledge Christ the King as in every aspect of our lives, absolutely across the board, in both our public and private lives. And this duplicity, this double-mindedness, this failure to seek first the kingdom of God as justice, this rejection of Christ the King is at the very root of the chaos and the chastisement that we're suffering right now in the church. It's a nightmare. As a Catholic people, we've deserved the nightmare because we've possessed the faith and trappings of Catholicism, but not its heart. Go to any church, in any right, and I include ours, and after all, everybody goes to community, how many of them make any meaningful thanksgiving? Or is there a stampede out the church door? As a Catholic people, we deserve the nightmare because it possessed the faith and trappings of Catholicism, but not its heart. We've deserved it. For the most part, we still do. We don't need to pick on the liberals. Just to pick one example, you still see people that call themselves traditional Catholic shopping on Sundays just as if it were business day, just as if there's no second commandment, just as if Our Lady La Salette hadn't come in 1846 specifically to warn against committing this terrible sin. And then they looked down their nose at so-called Novus Ordo Catholics. Okay. So it's obvious the standard traditional explanation for the crisis. The council is hijacked, the liberal clergy is in control of virtually everything, completely missed the forest for the trees. According to the teaching of Vatican I, God is in some way positive and willing the orientations and policies of the pontificates during and since Vatican II. And if these policies seem in any way evil to us, then we each need to stop and enter into ourselves and examine our consciousness. Have we been guilty of spiritual duplicity? Have we really, we really sought first the kingdom of God and his justice? Or have we tried to have it both ways? Catholics for an hour or two on Sunday, and then the rest of the week, just regular Americans. Have we been guilty of a sort of elitist attitude that we're the people that have the true religion, the true mass, while forgetting the traditional mass is only a means to an end? Have we been guilty of confusing means with ends? The traditional liturgy, the beauty, the chant, polyphony, these are means, they're important means. I think they're worth dying for. They're important means. But let's be clear. They're still only means. They're only means. The end is union with Christ. The end is union with Christ. The end is holiness. And holiness is directly proportional to humility and charity. This is a means. All this talk about how the council's hijacked, the little clergy in control of it, a lot of it's true, but even if it's all true, every last speck of it, in terms of growing humility or charity, this sort of talk, for the most part, is spiritually barren. Why is that? Because for the most part, this sort of talk so seldom leads to humility and charity. Because it doesn't lead to humility and charity, it's the spiritual equivalent of contraception. This is not the time to be messing with spiritual contraceptives. This is not the time. We don't have much time. We don't have much time. Each one of us needs to ask himself, do I believe, do I really believe that Christ is the King? And if I believe that, is that obvious in my thoughts, in my words, and in my deeds? God sees everything. God is looking for an undivided heart. Let's close with a few thoughts from the Carmelite doctors. From a commentary in the little way, St. Therese sets out a wonderful view, a wonderful vision of the mystery of the Church. Her conclusion is that in the mystical body of the Church, love lies at the basis of all vocations, the love that the Holy Spirit kindles in the hearts of Christians. If this burning love died out, there would be no more missionaries, no more preachers, no more martyrs. 
there would be nothing at all left in the church. Love alone is the life of the whole body of the church. What the church needs most is genuine love. We attach too much importance to externals, actions, and physical effectiveness, whereas all that counts, all that really bears fruit in the church, is the truth and purity and sincerity of love. That is what we should ask God for most of all and put into practice. Close quote. St. John of the Cross. Quote, The smallest act of pure love is more precious in the sight of God, more profitable to the church and to the soul itself than all other works put together. In the evening of life, we will be judged on love alone. Close quotes. Love alone is the life of the whole body of the church. What the church needs most is genuine love. The smallest act of pure love is more precious in the sight of God, more profitable to the church and the soul itself than all other works put together. We attach too much importance to external actions and visible effectiveness, whereas all that counts, all that really bears fruit in the church is the truth and purity and sincerity of love. That's what we should ask God for most of all and put into practice. In the evening of life, we will be judged on love alone. In the evening of life, we will be judged on love alone.